We've been interviewing top economists about the outlook for the global economy and the path forward. Today, we're speaking with Jeffrey Sachs. He's a best-selling author and a professor at Columbia University. Dr. Sachs, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to start off with what you see as the current state of the U.S. and the global economy. Clearly, uh, we're in a mess, uh, the worst economic crisis in decades. And I think it will remain this way as long as we have a pandemic. In other words, as long as COVID-19 is spreading, uh, is not decisively contained. It's possible that the virus can be contained either through public health or the good luck of a vaccine. That would change the picture quite a bit. But if you consider the current situation in the United States of a runaway pandemic, uh, a lack of uh, any clear public policy, no vaccine uh, within sight for the moment, uh, I think we have to say that this is a a very uh, deep crisis that's likely to persist. What's your view of what the economy will look like on the other side and and how soon is the other side? The only way we could have had a V-shaped recovery is if we had contained the virus quickly. Uh, China is the exemplar of a country that had actually a runaway pandemic. It had the first one in Wuhan, but it got it under control. And now China is recovering. That's a V-shaped recovery. We are definitely not having a V-shaped recovery in the United States because we did not stop the virus. How do you explain the difference between what's happening with the stock market right now and that economic picture that you painted that's pretty grim while, you know, stocks are positive for the year? Clearly, the stock market is going up in part because the Fed has pumped in $3 trillion into the economy. We know that if you pump in enough money, uh, you can get asset prices to rise. And so this is the playbook of uh, 2008 and afterwards, and it is at work again. Partly, the stock market simply doesn't capture the whole economy. The stock market is not the restaurants and the shops uh, that are going out of business in large numbers. The stock market is Amazon and Apple and Microsoft and big enterprises much more online, while the brick and mortar, smaller and medium enterprises are going broke. So we're not seeing in the stock market a snapshot of the whole economy. We're seeing a snapshot of the piece of the economy that is either persisting or doing well because it is online. We've seen the unemployment rate come down a bit from the recent high, but it is still at a very high level. How long do you think it will stay that high? And are there some jobs that might never return after this this crisis? Clearly, we're going to shed millions and millions of jobs permanently because this accelerated shift to work from home to online is not going to go back uh, to uh, the pre-COVID normal, partly because a lot of this is better in some sense Uh, when work can be done online from home. And so part of this is just efficiency. Part is an acceleration of trends that were underway, like e-commerce, that were already happening. Uh, And in this sense, uh, we were already losing jobs to AI, to robotics, uh, to uh, uh, e-commerce, and so forth. And those jobs uh, that are lost now in those sectors will not come back because we basically had an accelerated jump into the future. uh, And there's no reason to expect that that will reverse. What's your view of this globalization and deglobalization idea now, right now and, and then going forward as well? I think globalization will persist because it's based on uh, communications and uh, transport and technology that is just better than ever in a sense. So uh, especially as we move online, you can move online anywhere. So workplaces will be online and will be global because the best talent can be found anywhere. That won't go away. But what is happening in part is that as we understand the structural changes that are needed in the future, not only because of COVID, but also because of climate. The fact that we'll be moving to electric vehicles, the fact that we'll be moving to 5G, the fact that we'll be moving to renewable energy. There, what's happening is not exactly deglobalization, but uh, industrial policy in the US, in Europe, 
and in Asia saying, we want a piece of that future, so we're going to protect our electric vehicle sector. We're going to uh, produce the wind turbines or the photovoltaics. We want a battery supply chain. What I do worry about is something else, which is a geopolitical Cold War. This is a dreadful mistake. Uh, God help us if we go that way. The last Cold War was dangerous enough. This one would be even more dangerous. It's completely misconceived and misguided, but a lot of Americans uh, want to put it to China and uh, think that we run the show and all the rest, which is a very dangerous way of thinking, actually. So what's your view of the U.S.-China relationship? Is it going to continue this escalation that we've seen in the past few months? Will there be some sort of reconciliation? How do you see that playing out? What people say about China is, to put it uh, plainly, stupid. People who don't know, uh, who have this uh, weird image uh, of this totalitarian monster out to take over the world, that is lazy, but not completely atypical American thinking in the past. China's not out to take over the world. Uh, China's not out to do all these terrible things. China wants to have a normal, decent life like Americans want to have. China lives at a living standard, something like a third or a fourth or even a fifth of Americans. They want their place in the sun also. It doesn't mean they're taking over. But this heated idea that they ripped us apart, they did this terrible thing, they did that terrible thing, this has become bipartisan. It can become very, very dangerous in the future. While politics is a game and a pretty tough one in the U.S., it's an incredibly dangerous sport also. And to play with the facts and the lies that we're saying about China right now has consequences. But from a pure economic perspective, could China still become the world's biggest economy? Well, let's put it this way. In terms of aggregate gross domestic product, if measured at international prices, so-called, uh, purchasing power adjusted, China already is the world's biggest economy. But not surprising because China has four times the population of the United States, uh, and it has a per capita income in those international dollars of about a third of the U.S., so it's four-thirds larger than the United States uh, in aggregate terms. China does not live at the level of affluence of American citizens on average, but it's a very big country. You um, have been an advocate of social democracy, uh, systems like what we have, what we see in Sweden. Do you think that the pandemic might bolster the case to have that sort of a system going forward? Is there any more likelihood that the U.S. might adopt policies more similar to societies like those? What those societies offer is uh, that you have health insurance, that's all. Uh, that you pay uh, 10 or 12 percent of the national income, not 20 percent, because you get your health care at affordable prices. You get to go to school uh, and uh, get an education without ending up with a generation of $1.6 trillion of debt. And they live a good life in those countries, uh, but uh, they don't just let anything go. Uh, they tax and they pay their taxes so that everybody has these basics. Are there certain policies that you think would help alleviate some of the economic inequality that has become so transparent over the past few months? Well, just to say that uh, we have had such an unbelievable increase of inequality in the last few months. I think when the dust settles, we will find out that because of endless cheap credit of the Fed that is fed into Wall Street and then becomes an amplifier of inequality, and because of the inequalities of moving online away from brick and mortar, we're going to have to ask how can we ensure that everybody has health care, everybody can get an education, and that's going to require some 
fiscal policy and public policy to say, you know, it's crazy for us to be this unbelievably wealthy society and have more and more tens of millions by the time this is over, 100 plus million people living desperately, that's what we're gonna have to face up to. How would you judge this current moment in the US and or globally? You know, What do you think we'll look back on when we look at this time in the future? We're in a uh, remarkably uh, choppy period of disruption and, and uh, transition. Uh, our geopolitics are changing because we're going to a multipolar world. Our technology is changing fundamentally because we're going to a digital world. Uh, and our physical environment is in upheaval, whether it's the zoonotic diseases like COVID-19 or the human-induced climate change. So how we're going to look back at this is going to depend on how we face these crises. If we face them together, cooperatively, with a sense of decency, we'll have some pride that the waters were very high and very choppy, but we made it through. Uh, if we face it as uh, each one is on, uh, on your own, and we're going to look back with a lot of regret.